best friend. Wow. Cigarettes, I couldn't live without. Uh -huh. I can live without my partner, but I can't live without my drug. Wow. Uh, okay. So those, the ABCDE. A very, very um, definitive uh, uh, individual. She is uh, educated. She's professional. She is getting on with her life. And she is probably quite affluent. And she's drinking more than um, her mother's generation did. So it's troubling. It's, uh, we go toe-to-toe -to -toe, uh, in the workforce, and we outnumber men in the post-secondary set, and yet this is taking place. Wow, my goodness me. Well, you know, if you are concerned about your mom, your sister, yourself, please give us a call. We are here to help. Call into the show this evening. You know, going back to your own story, Mm -hmm. You know, you are a professional woman, you have a great job, and you took time out because you realized that you were struggling with this as well. Right. Can you give us a little insight into that? I hit a major depression in my 50s, mm -hmm. and my drinking had been um, relatively normal in my 20s, 30s, and 40s. But mm -hmm. in my 50s, hit menopause, hit a big depression, mm -hmm. and was told by my doctor that I shouldn't take a major job, which I indeed took, mm -hmm. um, in a different city, a very, very large job. Um, I fell down the bunny hole of addiction and I mm -hmm. fell quite quickly and within 17 months um, I was in deep trouble and yes took time off to go to treatment um, and I come out with that story in my book drink I also talk about my mother's addiction which was very different stay-at-home mom mm -hmm. mixing Valium and alcohol in in the 1960s really a poster girl for her era and I call myself a poster girl for mine right. which is professional and high bottom in my case I didn't crack up a car or miss work in fact I won awards at work mm -hmm. um, so it was, but I am, I am increasingly um, the poster girl for this era, which I don't say with pride as much as humility and say, this is what she looks like. This is what she looks like, the, the kind of woman who's getting in trouble now. And she tends to be educated and affluent. Right. And so you took time off and then you wrote this book. Right. You did so much research. I was, I was, I've been, I was reading some of the articles that uh, you had in the Toronto Star and was just astounded at the numbers, you know, that closing gap that you're talking about, mm -hmm. but just how women are just really hitting mm -hmm. the bottle these days. Yeah, um, I, I say it's about three things. Um, I think alcohol has become the modern woman's steroid, enabling her to do the heavy lifting that, that she wants to do, has to do in a complex world. Mm -hmm. You come home, you chop vegetables, you oversee homework that evening. Um, you have a glass of wine while you're preparing dinner, you might have one while you're cooking dinner. Uh, I mean, excuse me, eating dinner. Um, that's number one. Number two, heavily marketed too. We're called Wow. in my book um, I call it the pinking, the pinking of the market right mm -hmm. yes. and we are seeing you know mommy mm -hmm. juice skinny girl vodka uh, French rap, rabbit girls night out cupcake wine these aren't manly drinks mm -hmm. alka pops you know which steer young women in their teenage years mm -hmm. towards the hard liquors uh, vodka and tequila um, so marketing is is a big piece um, the other thing is self-medication and that was my story of, of depression so mm -hmm. that we are seeing um, all of these things happen in a vacuum, I, I think, um, where we're not talking about the health implications. We're not talking about the fact that 10 to 15 percent of breast cancer cases are related to alcohol ingestion. Right. We know all about trans fats. We do not know all about um, the 50 plus uh, diseases and cancers that are related to alcohol. We don't know about low risk drinking guidelines, which mm -hmm. are very much um, in, in play in Canada, but most people don't measure their drinks and aren't aware. Mm. So we're in a strange culture, and I think it's just to close um, because our values are very fuzzy. We don't want to know the downside of our favorite drug. It's complex. It is complex. And, you know, posing a question to you, the complexity of it, why are women, the psychology behind it, why are women Engage, engaging in this risky. Well, you know, you know, one of the things that really struck me about your book that I found just so amazing was how I think you said the alcohol industry at some point recognized that they had to build up, boost up their spirits, their liquor, and uh, 
they, they uh, discovered there was this underserviced market, mm -hmm. underserviced part of the population that was not getting their service. Uh, and so then as a result, it had this major marketing towards young people. And uh, I, 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 when I read that, I just thought, oh, wow, and was got really angry because I see, uh, uh, you know, a, in my work, uh, I, I see lots of young women who have succumbed to this seduction mm -hmm. of the alcohol industry. So this is actually a calculated move. Well, that's, yes. Yes, That's and and you know these the, you know teenagers, young women are vulnerable to uh, this. You know, it's like the Virginia Slims of the 1950s or whenever it was. This mm -hmm. is this is the way to be. Uh, uh, you, you talked about what was that term? An not an not anorexia, but it's drunkorexia. Yeah. We're seeing a huge yeah. rise in drunk drunkorexia, yeah. and the w and the whole notion was that the spirits industry was was looking at beer and saying beer is cleaning our clocks. Mm. What's happening? And mm -hmm. beer had men. Beer was sports. Beer was entertainment. Mm -hmm. um, women typically don't like beer. So they just, all the Johnny Walker drinkers were dying out and they said, they l looked at market segmentation and said, we have to look at women. A whole gender was, was underperforming. Under and so that's, <laughs> that's incredible. Yeah, yeah, that's the story. And if, if you look at the global map of where, uh, alcohol, what type of alcohol is being consumed, I mean, most of the liquor has been in, in Europe and in Russia and in, over there. Mm -hmm. We are the beer culture here. And so, yeah, it's, this, is, this is the way to uh, rectify that imbalance. Mm -hmm. To rectify that imbalance. <laughs> yes. That's a horrible thing. Yes, it is. Oh, my it goodness is. me. You know, I've got to tell you, I, I'm, I'm not a drinker myself because when I was about, I think, around 20, 19 or so, I had my first sip of, of white wine. And it was just a few sips. And I was so violently ill wow. that um, I, I've never touched it since, mm -hmm. you know. But um, mm -hmm. the, the, the physical aspects of it, the physiology, mm -hmm. women... Well, you are know, smaller than men. Yes. I mean, you may actually have had an allergy. Th th it is actually possible to have an allergy to alcohol, like a true one, where uh -huh. you get flushed and sick and whatnot. But um, often, what, uh, often what you're describing is a, a pr pretty typical scenario of a social drinker or a mm -hmm. non-alcoholic, mm -hmm. because um, the alcoholic or the budding alcoholic might have that same violent oh, that, I just feel so sick and nauseous, but they still like the high enough that they are willing to drink, uh -huh. um, despite the fact that they're throwing up and hugging their toilet. You know, it's like you had that, no, this is not worth it. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's well, two yeah, sips, sick. ladies, two sips. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness me. But the risky drinking, though, mm -hmm. campuses, you know, girls, young. Mm -hmm. And I, I saw in one of your articles where even after graduating, they're still really hitting it. There was a, you had quoted someone who was saying that she and her girlfriends still right. were drinking the same way and mm -hmm. they wouldn't dream of not doing that. Right. So there's that whole mentality around it. Yes. The, the old, the, I, I think there's a real sense of I drink because I can, because I'm entitled. I'm doing everything that mm. men are doing and I'm also doing this. Mm -hmm. I mean, you hit campuses, which I do very frequently. And um, I'll take my alma mater, where at Queen's University in Kingston, they ask you on Frosh uh, weekend to stick out your arm take a magic mar marker and write your address on it because it's presumed <laughs> that you're going to pass out, oh, which wow. is terrible. Uh -huh. I mean, we do know that, that uh, alcohol is the number one date rape drug and it has been for a long time. Mm -hmm. So that's really mm -hmm. um, a dire situation. It's, uh, forget the frat boy stereotype, it's men and women going toe to toe mm -hmm. playing drinking games. He's drinking beer. She's two-thirds the size and she's drinking tequila or vodka. Mm -hmm. She's drinking the stronger drink. So uh, it's not a pretty picture. And we've seen some real fatalities and some awful stories in the past year. Yeah, it, right. And one of the things about uh, this kind of drinking, what we're calling risky drinking, um, you know, it's often, uh, especially younger, it's not the daily uh, dr drinking where you kind of develop a tolerance. And of course, that's not good either because over time that uh, uh, does, does a great deal of wear and tear on mm -hmm. the body. Right. But binge drinking is actually something that uh, that people will often think that's not alcoholism, it's not a problem. Um, but, uh, any, you know, a binge is classified as anything that's more than four drinks in one sitting. Mm -hmm. And um, four drinks in one sitting, especially if you don't have the tolerance, is really dangerous for the brain. It's really dangerous. I mean, you can have potential overdoses Absolutely. if you throw in other drugs along with it, which right. isn't unusual. Um, yeah.
Incredible. It's, it's, uh, binge drinking is very serious. There's actually more cause of uh, emergency visits from binge drinking than day-to-day uh, -day drinking. That's something to keep in mind as we go to break. We invite you to give us a call if you've got a, a question for our illustrious guest, or Dr. Uh, Vera Tarman. We'll be right back after the break with more help on Addictions Unplugged. Give us a shout. personal finance, or parenting. Toronto Speaks on Rogers TV speaks to what matters to you. Tune in live Monday nights at 9 and ask the experts on Toronto Speaks. Complete schedule at rogerstv.com. Anime! Give me one good reason why I shouldn't kill you right now. Because you're Jewish and it's the Sabbath. Hey, damn it. Tomorrow at 7? Can't. 6. How about 6.30? Okay. Oh, y'all have a good Shabbos now. Bring them on. The ones who aren't sure. The ones who can't wait. The ones with brand new shoes. And the ones with shoelace issues. The ones who love to be part of a group. And the ones who stand silent, tall, and more or less ready. At the YMCA, we never met a kid whose potential we couldn't see. Hi, I'm Shannon Skinner, host of Extraordinary Women TV. Join me every week as I speak with women who have the courage to listen to their hearts and make a difference. It's been so awesome to be on your couch. Welcome back to Addictions Unplugged. I'm Bev Miller and joining me each week is Dr. Tarman. Today we're discussing and taking your questions on women and alcohol. The growing number of women and girls who are becoming addicted to alcohol. Our special guest is Anne Dowsett Johnston, author of Drink, the Intimate Relationship Between Women and Alcohol. If you've got a question, if you've got a concern about someone that you love or for yourself with respect to alcohol, please feel free to give us a call. We are here to help. Ladies, back to you. Alcohol is ubiquitous. Right. You walk into any um, party event and the first question you'll be asked is red, red or, or white. white. <laughs> red or white. Red or white. <laughs> and right. it's an alcogenic culture and we see alcohol as a food group. We, we do. We we, uh, I it's, like it's, that. Yeah, it's invisible. It, it's a liquid for us, and we have not in any way as a culture absorbed um, the bad news, nor do we want to hear the bad news. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said earlier, our values are very fuzzy around alcohol. We don't really care um, about some of the public policies that keep us safe. Um, let's look at the argument about bringing alcohol into corner stores, which would have a huge effect on our culture mm. and a huge effect on, I mean, the three things that really affect how we drink are marketing, uh, accessibility, and pricing. And mm. we have had a monopoly in Ontario, and it's, it's very interesting. Other people, other generations thought about that. Mm -hmm. um, we are looking at the opening up potentially of a market, which would have huge ramifications on what happens. Mm -hmm. So policymakers, why don't they see that hidden danger, that's, oh. that looming? Yeah, it's fascinating, uh -huh. I think. Um, uh, in my series in the Toronto Star was, was a look at public policy and interesting because the mm -hmm. hand that looks at what is brought in, the cash cow of, of alcohol, does not look at, it's a different hand, uh -huh. what is it expended mm -hmm. on hospital visits, emergency room visits, policing, and so on and mm -hmm. so forth. And last year, Gerald Thomas, a really smart scientist, connected the dots for every province and territory. Mm -hmm. And there were only two where, in fact, there was um, 
uh, more money in the till at the end. Most provinces, including Ontario, were losing, and yet we don't. It's very, very costly, uh, very costly substance to us as a society. So um, we haven't had a public dialogue, and as I said, I think it's because we're uncomfortable about it. And there's still enormous amount of stigma. I'm part of a group called Faces and Voices of Recovery, which is um, a group that is trying to do for addiction what many did for mental health and reducing the stigma around addiction. Right. I'm more than five years um, sober and uh, I think it's um, incumbent upon a lot of us to show that this could be a happy life. There are five million plus Canadians in recovery and we want to um, demonstrate that this can be a very productive and happy life. We tend to think of as addic addiction as a revolving door where people stumble and stumble right. and never get out. Right. It's just but not true. That's fantastic. You know, in one of your articles I see here 19.9 .9 billion dollars spent on mm -hmm wine, liquor. Mm -hmm. right. This is across Canada on an annual basis. And going up every year. Yeah. Going up every year. And so it's really important, I think, for us to look at as a society. I mean, when Canadians were asked a few years ago what was more costly, illicit drugs or alcohol, two-thirds of Canadians said, oh, it has to be illicit drugs. It's just not true. The reverse is true. But what about the, the cynical response, which is that uh, you really couldn't cut down alcohol because there's a tremendous tax benefit for the government? Well, just as I said, uh, there's a tax benefit and there's an a, even larger cost. Mm. And we're not connecting the dots between what one hand of the government's doing the other mm. hand. So one hand's taking the money in, the mm. other hand is spending. And um, so it ends up being very mm. costly for society. Mm. The thing is that it can be so disruptive to families. Can you talk to us a little bit about the disruption that... Uh, just from the point of view of families, like the social piece, yes, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, there's the whole health piece as well, but right. social, of course. Um, well, I mean, it can, it can uh, affect, uh, I mean, look what it's doing to the children. If the mom or the dad is uh, alcoholic, it, first of all, predisposes them to having alcoholism, like, uh, up to uh, three or four times more. Um, it, it also, the level of abuse, whether it's physical, whether it's sexual, whether it's just neglect, um, is increased tremendously, and these are people that will be patients of the healthcare system mm -hmm. in the future, either as addicts, alcoholics, or as depressives or anxi anxiolytics. So, um, it's it, it can be um, a, a real family uh, uh, disruption in the family, right. disruption for school, um, uh, and then of course there's the whole marital piece. You know, I mean, it it, it affects the families, uh, union. It's it's just not a useful thing, even if both parties are drinking. Wow. Yeah. You know, disability, illness, mm -hmm. violence, mm -hmm. injury, death. Mm -hmm. That's right. All and, of and these are outcomes. Yes, and, and more so with women. Uh, or Women can't tolerate alcohol as well as men. Oh, so, so we're smaller to yeah, begin with. That's right. And it's yeah. not just that we're smaller, it's also that we don't have the same metabolism. We don't mm -hmm. have um, the equivalent uh, efficacy of our enzymes that break down alcohol. Mm -hmm. So it remains a toxin in the system longer. Uh, and uh, therefore, the negative effects happen much more quickly than they do for uh, men. Okay. So then, uh, psychologically, with respect to women, mm -hmm. um, the incidence is rising with respect to women drinking. Is that a, is there a psychological piece to that as well? What is well, I mean, there, in the sense that yes, a woman is more likely or more quickly to become um, an, an addicted to the substance. Right. I mean, there she is drinking because it's the pure thing to do uh -huh. now, and um, and they're more quickly to develop an addiction or a dependence than a man. I mean, a man can drink. Um, uh, it could be 10 years, 15 years, whereas for a woman it might only take five years. Mm -hmm. It's much quicker. Uh, so just on that level alone. But also women are, are like you were mentioning about the, uh, um, the expectations that women have, having to do the job and the kids and the everything. Um, and, uh, you know, how do we maintain that? But by having this, uh, you call it the steroid, you know, the thing that keeps wo a woman going. Right, so that coming home in the evening mm -hmm. and having a drink to unwind, mm -hmm. when does that become problematic? Well, uh, 
you know, it depends on, on uh, the, it's so hard to answer that question because there's so many different angles. Right. But uh, just simply, um, if, you're, if a woman is drinking more than uh, one or two drinks a day, uh, whether it's an actual addiction or not, that's already then starting the ball going in terms of the health consequences. You don't, you, you, even one drink a day predisposes a woman to breast cancer. Um, drinking more than that, in, ever so, ever more so. Uh, but you know, more than two drinks a day, we're talking about the potential for cirrhosis, uh, for uh, brain atrophy, for all sorts of unpleasant trees of the future. Okay. Uh, so, you know, we, we, I think you mentioned the concept of safe drinking. Well, that's, you know, that's one or two drinks or less. All right. Yeah. You know, we do have a caller. We have Catherine on the line. Catherine, thank you so much for calling in. How are you? Hello, how are you? Good, good. What questions do you have for us tonight, Catherine? Okay, well, I found this discussion very interesting. Um, as I am a woman who has been drinking for, I guess, half my entire life. And, uh, <laughs> and, um, it's become to the point of maybe a liter of vodka a day. Mm. I um, now the the question that I had is that as a woman, sometimes we don't care about it. It can ruin your financial, your job, everything. I've lost my car license, everything like that. Mm. But what really started to affect me socially was my stomach with uh, ascites. I'm not quite sure exactly ascites. what the, the yes, problem is. Um, my stomach protruded to the fact that it was far past my breath and I look like I'm pregnant. Uh -huh. So I have not left the house in about three years, pretty much. Um, I mean, aside from just going to work and hiding behind clothes and I don't go out in the summer. I haven't been out in the sun in three years. Catherine, just So I was wondering how does one, um, I know people say cardio, they say get active, but how does one, just not turn to the bottle anymore. Okay, Catherine, let me ask you a question. Um, uh, when a person has what you're describing as ascites, that's a pretty serious condition. Have you seen your doctor in the last three years? Um, I wanted to get my license back, so no, I haven't. No, you haven't. Um, I, I mean, I, I feel quite alarmed for your health because uh, ascites means that your liver is affected. And um, I, I, I think that it's, 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 it's imperative that you seek help for, uh, for that. Uh, it's a pretty serious condition. Um, well, I, I know it's, I don't have a jaundice or anything. No. I, I'm not quite sure, but I, just, I want to kill the pain. I want to kill the uh -huh. embarrassment. You, you know, you can. Um, you're, you're calling. You're reaching out for help right now. Why don't you? Um, <clears throat> Uh, I mean, I, I really applaud you for doing that. Absolutely. Uh, um, and uh, uh, there is help out there. Uh, y you know, you're embarrassed, but uh, if you you can find help for, for other people who are suffering from the same thing, if you call a treatment center, we actually at Rogers here, um, and even on my website, Addictions Unplugged, you can find a, a number where you don't need to be embarrassed. People will be very uh, accessible to you uh, to to help you stop because you're, what you're describing is uh, being addicted to something, and everybody. Uh, I mean, Anne can tell you from her own experience, had had the very same experience. You are not alone in this. Yeah, I'm, I'm in my early 30s, and I, I just don't want to die yet. I, no. I don't. It mm -hmm. seems like life is over. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. You, you know, if you seek out help, you will get past this point um, and, uh, where you won't need the substance, uh, the drink as much as you do. Uh, and uh, uh, anyway, I, I just I feel really worried for you. Uh, do you want, do you want to add something from your yeah, own experience? Maybe? I, I couldn't agree with Vera more, and I think that, um, you know, it looks so difficult when you're on your side of, of um, mm -hmm. the fence to give it up. And I was exactly where um, you were, I mean, just desperate not to give it up and not knowing how to go forward. And um, you have to cry uncle and reach out for help and get as much support as possible to go through it because it's not for the faint of heart, but it's enormously possible to mm -hmm. put it behind you and to reclaim your life and, and be happy. And it, it is um, a progressive disease that really gets terribly serious. I, I lost one parent and my other parent is, mm -hmm. is addicted as well and I just really hope for you that you'll uh, see your doctor and look for help as soon as possible. The reason that I was mentioning about this being a women and alcohol issue yes. is that this is about appearance. 
And for men, they could maybe just have a clean shave right. and cut their hair, and they'd be fine. But yes. women, it, it's now bloatedness and like, just complete, dis it's, it's ruined to my entire body. So, but, but, yeah. but, you know, Catherine, if I can just say that, uh, um, if you were to be treated for your condition, the, the ascites, like the physical effect of the alcohol, um, uh, you're going to look a lot better. Like you'll lose that. That's that's all water weight, and you'll lose that weight, uh, and and you'll be making yourself healthier as well. I mean, some of what you're experiencing are the actual consequences of alcohol, and when you stop and retard that process, like Anne says, it gets worse and worse. You can actually go back and uh, look much better. Like I mean, look at how beautiful Anne looks, and I'm sure that you didn't look that good no. five years ago. Like like if you, if you just want to look on it from that level, uh, you're gonna you're gonna do better. They call it nature's greatest beauty boost is giving up alcohol and <laughs> it's amazing and what, what you look like when you arrive um, to get help and you know I was blotchy and bloated and uh, had circles under my eyes and my son had written a Mother's Day card that pointed out that my eyes were always bloodshot and I think that, that there's no telling what can happen to you and I, I can't underscore enough how much I think you should probably get help. Thank you very much for uh, this discussion. It's really enthralling and um, really hits home. Thanks, Catherine. Good Thanks luck. so much for ca for calling, Catherine, and be encouraged. That was that really took courage yeah, to call in and, yeah. you know, you, and you say did, those things. You did you did make this call for help, so take the next step. Right. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. It is a disease. Mm -hmm. I remember when um, uh, very sad story. My cousin was killed by a drunk driver, and I remember that morning mm. saying, "I have lost my childhood. I lost my cousin, mm. and um, I'm losing myself. I will give it up." And learning that week that I was incapable of giving it up. You know, I would say, "Tomorrow I'll only have one, or I'll have nothing." Mm -hmm. I couldn't do it, and that's addiction. Mm -hmm. That's addiction. And and when you're in that kind of situation where you you are drinking the kind of vodka or the amount of vodka that Catherine was talking about, you need you you can't do it alone. I. I mm -hmm fundamentally believe it's impossible. And so it's not a matter of willpower. Mm -hmm. It is not willpower. a matter of willpower. No. Mm -hmm. No, because willpower is the, I mean, when a person is inebriated, the willpower is drunk along with everything right. else. Like, it, it just doesn't have the, and also the insight, you know, the ability to recognize that you have a problem. It's that repeated, I keep trying and I can't stop, that, that is, the, uh, is the cue. That's Absolutely. the cue that there's something wrong with this picture. Ladies, we have another caller, John. John is on the line. Hi. Hi, John. You? Thanks for calling. How can we help you this evening? Okay. Like like I'm an assistant director, we're like making and we're producing a movie right now. It's called Between the Lines. It's got to do with stigmas and um, harm reduction of stigmas drug users face and any with addiction. Because personally, I think alcohol is a big addiction. A lot of people don't look at it that way. They try mm -hmm. to divide the two, and I don't think that's the case. Now, my question is, who's at a higher risk, male or female, for cirrhosis of the liver? Hmm. Well, when you're at the stage of cirrhosis of the liver, then the, the risk is the same. But women get there much more quickly than men. Uh, cirrhosis of the liver is, you know, the end stage. It's when the liver is really uh, uh, failing. And then you start to have the consequences, like our previous caller, where you get the bloating of the, of the uh, abdomen. Um, uh, but women definitely will get there sooner and much sooner. I, I, I remember when I was an intern in the hospital, I, I w went upstairs and I saw this very perky young woman, uh, you know, writing on her laptop and she just, I, I wanted to know, what are you doing here? And she said, oh, I got cirrhosis. I said, you've got cirrhosis? She, she didn't look like what I would have expected because it hit her so quickly. Mm -hmm. And there she was, uh, you know, potentially uh, looking at uh, um, whether she'd be able to maintain her liver if, or if she'd need some, uh, a transplant or something like that, if she could stop drinking. I don't know if you wanted to add.